Good evening. My name is Annie Black. I am the Director of Programs and Volunteers for the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. We're happy to have you all with us tonight for our History Highlight Series. I'd like to start by thanking our community partners for tonight's program, AJC Dallas Community of Conscience Coalition, Denton Black Film Festival, Educational First Steps, Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, Jewish Family Service of Greater Dallas, Legacy Senior Communities, Mental Health America of Greater Dallas, Resource Center, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, Uplift Education, and World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. As always, we sincerely appreciate all your support of the museum and our programming. Uh, tonight, we are going to see just a few highlights from our current special exhibition, The Fight for Civil Rights in the South, uh, which is actually two photography exhibitions brought to us by our friends at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. So what we're gonna do first is see some of these amazing photographs in this exhibit, and then we'll wrap up the program looking at some of the artifacts we are currently featuring in the exhibition as well. We do encourage you all to ask any questions you have during the program. If you wanna go ahead and locate your Q&A button, if you are on a computer, it's probably at the bottom of your screen. It might be at the top if you are on a tablet or mobile device. So again, anytime you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and open up that Q&A, type the question in, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the program. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sarah A. Bosch Jacobson, the museum's chief of education, Sarah. Thank you, Annie, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. I'm, I'm really pleased that you that uh, you could. I think that you will find this uh, very interesting. I, I know that I have. I will share my screen with you. Uh, no, that's not it. So, okay, Annie, I have a technical question. I have screen share and I have the program up. Uh, the the um, and it's just not coming up. Uh, Spencer, can you confirm that uh, Sarah has permission to share first? Does there it is? Okay, oh, it just came okay, up now. Perfect. <laughs> okay, can everybody see that? Yes, you're good to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You just want to full screen it for us? Yeah, perfect. There you go. Okay, so. Uh, this evening, we're going to talk about this current uh, special exhibit that we have had from uh, Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, the Fight for Civil Rights in the South. And as Annie told you just now, it is a combination really of two exhibits, photographic exhibits, and we brought them in together because together they really give a, a remarkable picture of what was going on in the South in the uh, early to, to, to mid 60s. And uh, Birmingham Civil Rights Institute were just absolutely wonderful to work with on this. And they are the owners of, of these photos. So these two photographic collections together portray uh, a really a pivotal moment in the, the civil rights movement uh, as civil rights in the United States moves to win voting rights and also actual civil rights on the federal level. And we'll come back to those in just a minute. So Courage Under Fire is the first, and that deals with one of the Freedom Riders buses that moved uh, into the Deep South in an effort to challenge segregation in interstate busing areas, including waiting rooms, restrooms, eating facilities, bus stations. It was illegal. Federally, there was a requirement uh, from the case uh, that, that was passed in uh, 1946 by the, or handed down by the Supreme Court uh, um, uh, in Virginia that required there to be no segregation any longer in interstate busing. But any African-American who had traveled from the North into the South and African-Americans who lived in the South were very aware of the fact that the, this Supreme Court decision was simply ignored. And so what happened was in 1961, the Congress of, of Racial Equality Corps made a decision that they were going to test the uh, segregation policy 
throughout, not the regular South, so not, not the upper South, but what they called the deep South. So Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, in the hopes that by bringing in freedom riders who were blacks and whites together, that the locals would back down. Uh, that's not how it, how it, how it turned out. Um, and even before we get to, 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 to the talk today, I just wanna very quickly, two minutes, lay the foundation or the groundwork for what we're talking about. So Civil War ends in 1865. Slavery is officially abolished in the United States. 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Lincoln makes slavery illegal in southern areas, but it doesn't make it illegal in areas that are that are not at war with the Union. 1865, uh, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution is passed, and that formally abolishes slavery. Followed in 1868 by the passage of the 14th Amendment, which formally gives citizenships to African Americans, followed in 1870 by the 15th Amendment, which gives African Americans, and by that we mean African American men, the right to vote because women didn't have the right to vote uh, in 1870. Those three amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment to the Constitution become known as the Reconstruction Amendments. And those amendments are uh, passed in such a way that any state that had been part of the Confederacy if it wants readmission to the union, must agree and uh, to these amendments, or they or they can't re-enter the union. This is all part of Reconstruction. So the efforts by by the union forces, by by the North, to rebuild a united United States after this this tremendous uh, horrible civil war, and to somehow pave pave over or, or kind of bind the wounds of the nation. It doesn't work out that way. By 1877, um, Reconstruction is dead. Uh, it, 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 it effectively uh, ceases. And throughout the South, Jim Crow laws begin to come into effect. And what Jim Crow laws do is they create a segregated, separate community. So blacks and whites may live side by side, you know, one neighborhood black, one neighborhood white. They may work side by side, but they are not part of the same culture. They don't use the same eating facilities. They don't use the same uh, uh, hotel facilities. They don't use the same entertainment facilities. Blacks are upstairs, whites are downstairs. There's signs all over the South, you know, white drinking fountain, colored drinking fountain. I mean, this is the nature of Jim Crow. By the 1950s, there have been efforts on the federal level to do away with this, but they have in large part not been successful in the South. Uh, white Southerners dig in their heels and they just refuse to budge. And so this um, Freedom Riders bus ride, and it's a series of bus rides actually, that begin May 4th, 1961, are an effort to challenge this and hopefully to get uh, some, of, some of the forces in the South that are pro-segregation to back down. The bus that we're going to talk about is a bus that leaves Washington DC on May 4th and is ultimately supposed to uh, make its way all the way to Louisiana traveling throughout uh, the deep south as I said. This bus is a Greyhound bus. A Greyhound bus and a um, Trailways bus both leave DC at the same time and there are six freedom riders on each one of those buses and these freedom riders have been trained in passive uh, uh, reaction, in other words, a nonviolent response. No matter what the response is that is thrown at them, they know to go limp, not to fight back, not to not to engender uh, violence, not to respond to violence with violence. And these two buses have riders going in pairs. A white and a black rider sit together, and they sit together outside of the back of the bus uh, as you head into the South, you know, uh, 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 Blacks, African-Americans are expected to sit behind in the back, whites are expected to sit in the front and they're not supposed to mix. And so 
on each of these buses, you have six on each, there's one white person who is designated as kind of the minder for the rest of the Freedom Riders because the thought is that if things turn um, violent or go south and they arrest these teams of riders, what's gonna happen is that this white person will be there to, to bail them out. And the bus, the Greyhound bus that we're talking about very slowly makes its way down. It's on the fourth, it leaves DC. Um, it ultimately comes into um, to, to South Carolina, kind of weaves its way down. There are people who yell at them as, as they pull into these stations. There are people who jostle them, but there is no real violence that, that they face as they head down. Um, amongst the riders is John L. Lewis, uh, who, who goes on to become a famous figure in the civil rights movement. Uh, the riders themselves are organized by and, and, and um, uh, helped by the head of, uh, of CORE at this time, James Farmer. And Farmer is a, 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 an incredibly um, significant figure uh, in, in uh, CORE and, and in the freedom riding uh, movement. And ultimately, the riders make their way to Alabama. And the first bus that comes into Anniston, Alabama, which is a little town that's about an hour um, due uh, west of the Alabama-Georgia border. It's actually not that far from Talladega where the famous NASCAR uh, racetrack is. And I, I've been there, it's, it's a, it, it has a, an old Jewish community in this little town too. Anyway, they come into Alabama and they have been warned because people have gotten news to them as they've stopped and overnighted in other areas that the Klan in Alabama and particularly the Aniston Klan are very nasty and that they're up in arms and, and they're getting ready to, to, to really try and rattle uh, the Freedom Riders who are, who are, as I said, forcing the issue of interstate busing uh, segregation. So what you see here is a picture of the bus as it has rolled into uh, Anniston. But what you'll notice is that the bus is on the side of the bus station and not on the front of the bus station. For those of you who, like me, are a little bit older and have actually traveled the country via bus, there's a to, to the left of this, of what you're looking at right here, there's a big greyhound dog sign on the front of the bus station. But the bus station is closed and the local clan forced the bus station to close. They did this because what that meant is that it forced the bus to come around to the side of the building. That's where it is now. And you'll notice that there is a man sitting on the ground here. He's an 18 year old member of the Aniston clan. He's an ex-convict um, and he's sitting in front of the bus on the ground to keep the bus from leaving. You'll also notice that there's a crowd of men gathering. Um, and you'll notice that for the most part, they're not dressed all that scruffily. This is a Sunday and these people in all likelihood have come from church uh, to this uh, uh, rally, which is gonna become a, a mob scene. What you can't really see in this picture is what they are doing, these members of the Aniston clan, is beating the sides of the bus with baseball bats, with hammers, with two by fours. And they're attempting to shake up the freedom riders who are in the bus. And there are also some other riders in the bus too, who probably have no idea what's going on. The clan members smash the windows of the bus. They, they take knives and they, and they rip at the tires of the bus. And this goes on for about 15 or 20 minutes. Or, or as one of the Freedom Riders says, uh, it felt like it must have been hours, but it wasn't. This next photo is a photo of the Aniston police showing up. And the Aniston police show up and they talk to the Klan and they basically say, okay, boys, fun's, fun's fun. Your fun is over now. Let them leave. And they, they tell the Klan to, to get out of the way. And that's what you're seeing here. And what happens is that the bus then um, closes its doors and the driver drives out of town, out of Anniston. As he reaches the outskirts of Anniston and by outskirts, he's about six miles out from the center of town. 
they all start to hear that, that, that horrible sound you sometimes hear when a tire goes like, you know, that whomp, whomp, whomp. And he gets out to look and sure enough, the tire has gone flat and it's gone flat because they, they pierced it with, with knives when it was at the uh, station. He then goes back to the front of the bus, gets on the bus and he's kind of sitting there. He's not sure what to do. What you don't see in this photograph, but you would see uh, if you visit the, the collection at the museum right now is the prior picture has the bus on the road going out of Anniston, heading out of town. And it's got cars in front of it and cars in back of it because it has an escort of Klansmen out of Anniston. And what you see in this photo is um, a couple of things. You see the shoulder of a, of a man standing in the doorway here. You just see the shoulder of his suit. He's in fact a plainclothes policeman because there were a couple of plainclothes uh, police assigned to the bus because Alabama, when they hit the state line, they expected um, some trouble. It's not clear what their, what their role is other than to observe, but what he's doing here is he's standing in the open doorway and keeping Klansmen from actually entering the bus. What you see next to it in this uh, reflected window here are some of these Klansmen who have followed the bus, as I said, out from Anniston, six miles into the country. And what you can see is that there's a lot of them. This is a mob. And then the final thing that you see is you see these two Freedom Riders, one black, one white, staring doggedly ahead because they, they're not making eye contact with this hostile crowd. The final thing that you see here, and it's backwards, is this sign that says Forsyth and Sons or Forsyth and Sons, because it just so happens that the bus tires go flat in front of a little grocery, in, in front of a, a, a little rural, um, like a crossroads. And that's what Forsyth and Son is. And so the, the plainclothes policeman is keeping the Klan from coming into the bus. And the Klansmen at this point are rocking the bus. They're smashing windows that have not been smashed out. And it's kind of a standoff and nobody knows what's gonna happen. Very shortly thereafter, one of the Klansmen takes a um, wad of uh, fabric um, and a bottle and lights it with some, some gasoline and throws it in one of the back bus windows. And anybody who studied any Russian history, this is a classic Molotov cocktail. They basically throw a homemade Molotov cocktail through the window. And so what you see here that looks sort of like clouds is not in fact clouds. It's not a reflection on the outside of the window. You're in the front of the bus looking into the bus and this is smoke that's beginning to gather in the bus. And what you'll notice is that, again, nobody's moving off the bus and they're not moving off the bus because they're afraid to. They're afraid that if they step off the bus, they're going to get beaten to death. The next picture that you see is a policeman who has a pistol uh, in his hand, and this is not a plainclothesman, and he is pointing the gun in the air. And in fact, because we know the history of this, he has just fired the gun. So what has happened is very simply this. When that Molotov cocktail, that, that burning rag uh, concoction exploded on the bus, the Klan got even closer to the bus. And there was a second explosion, not a huge one, toward the rear of the bus. And the fear was that the gas tank was gonna go up. And so the Klan began to back away from the bus pretty quickly. At the same time, the bus began to fill with thick black smoke. And at this point, all the riders on the bus didn't have a choice. They had to get off. Some came off the front door where the plainclothes policeman had been, had been uh, standing. Some dove through the window on the far side. Some dove through the window on this side. Here you see Hank Thomas. We'll talk about him in just a moment. He was the first man off the bus. Uh, you see another rider. You see a plainclothesman helping her. And the Klan gets very, very restive and they're not sure what to do. And at that point, a local policeman who had apparently followed them out of town fires in the air to get the Klan to stay away from the bus, to back away from the bus. This is another scene uh, of the bus. It's just um, 
uh, billowing of smoke out of the bus just to give you a sense of, of how horrible this was and how tremendously dangerous this was. Here's another scene. And in this one, you can see the Forsyth and Sons, the grocers uh, here, uh, the, the actual groceries right, right off uh, to the side. This picture is particularly interesting. This is one of the policemen in regular uniform and then one of the plainclothes folks who had actually been riding on the bus. And the gentleman who is bent over there, um, who's being actually comforted by, by the plainclothes policeman is Hank Thomas, uh, Henry Hank Thomas. And Hank Thomas was a student who was part of this uh, core freedom ride, he was the first person off the bus when they finally started piling off the bus. And a group of five men approached him and said, are you okay? As he came off the bus, white men. And he started to say yes. And one of them hit him in the head with a two by four. And so the plainclothes policeman moved in and, and was, was protecting him from, 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 from further physical damage. But so he's suffering from smoke inhalation. He's also suffering probably from a concussion at this point. Here you see a picture of a fireman putting the fire out, but what you'll notice is that there's not really a fire to put out at this point. This is a hulk of a bus. This is a wreck. There's not much left. And in fact, some of the histories that report on this say that the local fire department dragged its heels because they were not in favor of desegregating the South. And so they just didn't make any rapid moves to, to get to this, this bus to, to help. Here you see uh, two Freedom Riders drinking water. Um, one of them is actually trying to clean his hands off. Everybody's suffering from smoke inhalation. They're all outside of that, that grocery store there. Um, and there's an interesting story uh, about this because the water was brought to them by the daughter of the Forsyth and Sons grocery owners. And she was 11 or 12 years old at the time. And she brought water out and she started handing it out. Anybody she saw who was coughing and gagging from the smoke, she started handing water to. The postscript on this is that her family got face forced out of the area um, later because of harassment because because they had they had helped uh you know these 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 uh people who were attempting to to uh desegregate the area and then this uh final photo of this sequence is a perfect a picture of a smiling firefighter who may be doing some investigation it, it's not clear so a couple of things I want to share with you, and then we'll move on to the to the next set of photos, which is these photos were all taken by a guy named Joe Postiglione, who worked for the Aniston Star, which was the local Aniston newspaper. Uh, he was a little bitty guy, five foot two, five foot three, uh, known fondly as Little Joe. And he happened to be there that day as a stringer for the Aniston paper. And so he took these photos. These photos went round the world. And these photos uh, had a tremendous uh, impact both in Washington, DC, uh, uh, but, but also on the wire services worldwide. Beyond that, what you need to know is that the next bus, which was supposed to um, be following in their, in their footsteps, made it as far as Anniston as well. And when the Trailways bus came to Anniston, people boarded the bus, uh, Klan members, and they beat the daylights out of some of the riders. And that ride made it as far as Birmingham, Alabama as well. So neither one of these buses ever left Alabama. But what they did is they sparked the um, Freedom Riders bus movement, which took place from the summer all through uh, from the uh, excuse me from the from the spring May all the way through through the late summer, uh, more than 400 riders ultimately took took place in in these uh, bus rides. There were more than uh, 60 rides that actually occurred. Many of these riders made it uh, as far as Mississippi later in the summer where they were arrested and sent to Parchman State Farm and held for a month, two months in an attempt to break their spirit. Their spirit was not broken. Um, but this was this was one early uh, nonviolent uh, 
uh, movement uh, 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 that occurred. The next set of photographs that we're going to talk about is the Selma to Montgomery uh, set. And Selma to Montgomery occurs in 1965. Oh, one other thing that I, I'm sorry I left out, which is that one of the things that Aniston and the Freedom Rides led to, um, and it's not the only thing that leads to it, but it definitely has a major impact on the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64. So, so, so there is a direct connection to this nonviolent action and federal movement uh, in response. So Selma to Montgomery. Selma to Montgomery is in response to moves for voting rights and voting access for African Americans mm -hmm. in Alabama and more broadly African Americans throughout the South. These photographs are taken by uh, James Spider Martin is his name. Uh, he was called Spider uh, not because of any particular um, a thing relating to his photography ability, but because he used to scramble when he played uh, high school football and they said he looked like a spider on the field. And Spider Martin is interesting. He's also small. He's either five foot two or five foot three. I don't know why these guys were were such such small guys um, physically. Their presence is quite frankly and their photographic legacy is huge. Um, so Spider Martin was young. He was in his early 20s. He was, he was a stringer and uh, a photographic stringer. And he was sent down to Selma to cover the Selma to Montgomery March. The Selma to Montgomery March is actually not one march, it's three marches. And there are a series of three marches that occur uh, in uh, March of 1965. The first march known as, that comes to be known as Bloody Sunday occurs on the 7th of uh, March. The second March, which comes to be known as Turnaround Tuesday, occurs on the 9th of March. And then the third March, which is the successful March, occurs March 21st through March 25th. And so let's, let's talk about those very, very quickly. Um, they all three were spurred by the murder of a young African American Al in Alabama who had been working on behalf of voting rights and, and, and he, he shot dead. And so a decision is made um, by members of, uh, of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and others that they are going to march on behalf of voting rights. And they decide that the march is going to take place from Selma to Montgomery, which is the state capital. And in Montgomery, they'll then have a rally, uh, you know, on the, on the steps of the Capitol to, to, to force Governor Wallace's hand. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Reverend King, is contacted to be a part of this. And he, he says, no, I, I'm not going to do this. You're courting violence. This isn't going to end well. Um, there are other ways, there are other ways to, 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 to accomplish what it is that we're hoping to accomplish regarding voting rights. A decision is made by those involved in this um, movement uh, that they're going to go king or no king, that they, that, they are, that they are going to go on the seventh. And so what you see here uh, is Andrew Young, who goes on to be a UN ambassador amongst other things. And then you see Bob Mance, uh, John Lewis in the raincoat, uh, Hosea Williams, uh, um, Albert Turner, and all the way on the far right, uh, you see Amelia Boynton, who was also a famous civil rights figure. And they're praying outside of Brown's AME Chapel in Selma prior to starting the march. And so that's what you see. And, and again, there are a lot of religious folks, including um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference involved in various aspects of the civil rights movement. So it's, it's perfectly appropriate and perfectly normal for these folks to gather inside churches, immediately outside churches. Here you see the marchers and they're heading over the Pettus Bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Appropriately enough, Edmund Pettus was a Civil War Confederate general. Um, and here you have these folks heading over uh, this bridge and they get over the bridge and there's probably five or 600 of them. This is not the largest march. And when they get over the bridge, they are met by local uh, 
uh, police and and troopers. And they are told you will turn around and you will go back or there will be there will be problems. And you'll notice that many of the police are wearing gas masks. So they're, they're, they have every intention of using tear gas. They're armed. These folks are carrying nothing except backpacks. They also have truncheons with them. And the marchers refuse to turn around. This, by the way, uh, over here is John Lewis. Uh, and this is one of the following photos. What happens is they are set upon by the police, by the troopers, and they beat the daylights out of at least 80 people, 80 marchers. John Lewis has his skull fractured. Amelia Boynton is beaten unconscious. You see her here. So you saw her kneeling in prayer um, and you, uh, in, the, in the first photo, now you see her collapsed on the ground. The Bloody Sunday March ends in in this 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 horrible carnage. Uh, again, these photos go out around the world. Um, by this point, LBJ is president, and he is appalled. Uh, what happens next? Uh, we'll go back one photo for a second. What happens next is that Martin Luther King, the Reverend King, realizes he can't let this go. He simply has to get involved, bloody or otherwise. He has to be involved. And so he comes down to Selma and as the organizers of the marsh decide to go again on the 9th, so two days later on a Tuesday, he leads the marchers over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But what he says is we will get to the bridge and then we will take a knee and we will pray. There's 1500 people, many of whom are, are pastors and ministers, white and black who've flown in from all over the country to be there for this. We will take a knee, we will pray, we will then turn around and we will go back because we will have made our point. That comes to be known as Turnaround Tuesday. And the reason I point out the taking of a knee is because it's very interesting to me that there have been other knee takings uh, recently. I don't know that that's exactly a verb, but you know what I'm saying. And it comes in a direct line out of the civil rights movement. Anyway, so turnaround Tuesday happens and then they begin to plan and they decide that they're, they're gonna seriously go for it. And that is gonna be the third Selma to Montgomery March that they're gonna attempt. And that's gonna happen on March 21st. And in fact, that March is successful. A judge grants them the right to march. LBJ federalizes the Alabama National Guard and says, you report to me, you do not report to the governor of the state. You will protect these marchers. You will defend these marchers. Alabamians, uh, and here is a picture of some white segregationist Alabamians, one of whom is giving us that universally warm and welcoming middle finger salute, um, clearly are appalled by this, but not all of the Alabamians are, let's, let's be clear about that as well, but there, there is resistance. This then is the picture of folks as they have come over the Pettus Bridge in this third major march. You'll see it's a lot of people. Ultimately, uh, only 300 people are gonna be allowed to complete the entire march. The reason being there are sections of the march like the one that you're seeing here where they're going over single lane highway in each direction. And so the judge who gave them permission to march who said they have a, a right to march also limited the number who could physically march. And here you have a federalized uh, member of the Alabama National Guard guarding marchers. Here you have um, a gentleman, I don't know if he is an Alabamian or not. Um, he's an African-American who is making his views of what has been happening in Alabama crystal clear. Uh, and, I, and I absolutely love this. He also has a uh, button for a march that's gonna take place in, uh, in August, a march for, for jobs uh, in Washington. So, so he clearly has a, his political agenda outlined for himself. Here you have the feet of one of the marchers. Um, this march is more than 50 miles long. It takes place over the course of several days and the marchers are exhausted. I love this photo. 
Um, I don't know if this is a man or a woman. I don't know if this is a, a, an African-American or a white. I just know that this is somebody who's been marching like, like the Dickens and has mole skin on their feet from the blisters uh, that, that they've gotten from this. The next scene is of Dr. King uh, and his wife um, arriving in uh, Montgomery. Um, so they have successfully come through the march, although the march isn't over yet. This scene is of the march at its end. And this is Dr. King addressing the crowd at the Alabama State House. There were waiting for him when he and the other marchers got there, a crowd of about 25,000 people from all over the US, from as far away as Hawaii, there was foreign press that came over. I mean, this, this was a really, really uh, incredibly moving uh, time and moment. Um, the speech that he's given here is the speech where he has this call and response how long, not long, how long, not long. And it's also the speech in which he talks about the arc of the moral unit universe bent, being long, but the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. You know, in other words, hang on because we're going to succeed. What they do is they bring a petition with them, the marchers, which they attempt to give to Governor Wallace of Alabama. They're not successful in doing that. He refuses to come out of the state house. So they hand it to a secretary, but it does get handed over. Um, these are some uh, pictures of some of the segregationist response, because again, this is not happening in a vacuum. This is a picture of King later in the same year. This is August. So that first picture we saw of Dr. King, that's March 25th, 1965. This is August, and this is right after LBJ has signed into law the Voting Rights Act. And what I love about this particular picture is that he gives a talk at this time, and one of the things he does is he gives a shout out to James Spider Martin, and he says that Spider Martin's photos of what happened on Bloody Sunday and subsequently went round the world, and it's because of his his help in this that we're standing here. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful photo about that. The final photo I wanna show you from this sequence and then I'm going to hand off to Felicia so she can uh, review artifacts with you is of a shack in Alabama. It's probably a sharecropping shack. Um, and these are four young African-American kids there. You'll notice there's no electricity. I'm doubting very, because there's no wires running into the place from a, from a main line. I doubt there's running water in the place. There's probably an outhouse. And Spider Martin ended his series on this with this photo and he entitles this photo, Sweet Home Alabama. And I love this photo because I think what he wanted people to realize is that voting rights had been won, but that the fight for equal rights was simply not over. This was not the end of, this wasn't the end of the fight and this wasn't the end of the story. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna hand off to Felicia. Hello everybody. It's nice to spend some time with you this evening. Let me share, I'm gonna, just because we wanna switch through our slides at our own pace, we have the same presentation, but I'm gonna share it. Can you all see that? We can see it if you just want to full screen it, Felicia. That's going to take you back to the beginning. You might just have to scroll through. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. If you go to the bottom right from where you are now, that little present, you should be able to do that. Or if you click the button you just did, you'll just have to scroll through Sarah's slides to get back to yours. So just, yeah, if you just click the, click the button you just did, Felicia, and just scroll through to the one you want to start, okay. and I think that'll be easiest. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> Stay with me, guys. I'll get there. 
it's the same like if you all are presenting or doing something like this, you can do it better if no one's watching. <laughs> it's my experience anyway. Okay, here we go. Well, I'll start out by saying every time we present about our collections or our exhibit or our special exhibit, um, our special exhibitions, it's a wonderful opportunity, at least in my mind, to learn more about these artifacts that either come from our collection or we're able to borrow from partner institutions. And I love that about my job and about working with our, um, our audience. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. And the other thing I wanna say before we dig in is that these photos and these artifacts give a window and really impact me personally. And I hope you as our audience and the people who come to see the exhibit in person in a really meaningful way and sometimes in a hard hitting way. Um, and that's the magic of artifacts and photos that every person that walks through our door is impacted differently and connects with an artifact or a photo in a specific way. And so we want to make that opportunity available to everybody um, and help teach these difficult histories using artifacts and photos whenever we are able to. Um, we borrowed artifacts um, from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute to bring additional artifacts on display this spring. And we we're so honored that they were able to work with us. And then we still have some artifacts from our collection on display and from some partner institutions, including the African American Museum at Fair Park. Um, which I'm happy to, to, to tell you did make it through these recent storms without severe damage. So we're very happy to hear that. And then from some other partner institutions in North Texas. Um, just to give you an idea, if you haven't been able to come see us, and I hope you will be able to come see this exhibit before it closes on May 31st, we have five large display cases with 34 artifacts on display. Um, we're really proud of the way it turned out. We think it helps tell the story of the two photo uh, collections that we borrowed from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. The first artifact you encounter when you enter the exhibit is a, a streetcar divider. Uh, we wanted this to be the first artifact you encounter because of course the Freedom Riders were trying to bring attention to the fact that segregation on interstate travel and busing had been struck down by the Supreme Court and that it was still in place, thriving in the South. Segregated busing was operational in cities and in, in the countryside. And so this, this is a um, streetcar divider from Birmingham. Um, the photo, which you can see a little bit in the bottom left hand side is a photo of the interior of the streetcar from which, um, or an example, uh, um, a streetcar from which a similar divider would have been used. Um, and, you know, we know about Rosa Parks and her journey, but just to put in place the Jim Crow South and segregation, it seems a long way away to some of us who didn't experience it, but for many of, of our audience members, it was, a reality that they experienced and we want to acknowledge that. The next group of artifacts we borrowed from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute are, are really poignant and showed me a part of our history that I wasn't aware of and we want to share that with you. Um, on September 15th, 1963, a bomb was hidden inside a church, um, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. It was um, more than a dozen sticks of dynamite hidden behind the stairs of a church. It detonated on Sunday morning. It killed four young girls. The youngest of, uh, was 11 years old and 22 others were injured. Um, significantly, this was just one of dozens and dozens of bombs that were planted by KKK activists who were fighting against the civil rights movement, who felt threatened um, by civil rights that their white supremacy was under attack. Um, this horrific um, murder of four young girls who were in church getting ready for a choir per performance 
brought international attention to the civil rights movement. And there's some reason to believe that it really helps motivate or bring attention even all the way up to uh, President John F. Kennedy and our, uh, Robert F. Kennedy as well to bring more attention and, and mobilize for the civil rights um, legislation that was a couple, still a year or more away. The FBI was already embedded in the KKK, watching the KKK. They quickly were able to identify the perpetrators. Um, I was appalled to find out in my research for um, this exhibit that one of the KKK members was not arrested until the 2000s even though he was a known um, quantity. Um, so it's one of these miscarriages of justice um, that was eventually too late rectify. One of the KKK members who planted the bombs was, was died before he was arrested. Um, and significantly the fourth and final KKK member who died, died just last summer and he did die in jail but he was gonna be up for parole this year. Um, this is a scene or a photograph from a newspaper in Birmingham showing the uh, appalling amount of damage. Um, the four girls were crushed from cement wall falling um, and the chaos and I think terror that was really ruling in Birmingham must've been intense. I can't even really imagine it. Um, the family shared precious artifacts with the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, and they shared those with us for this exhibit. Um, we were honored to work with them. I want to share them with you. Um, Denise McNair, the youngest victim of this bombing, she was 11. Um, she was getting ready for choir practice. She um, was, of course, beloved by her family and her community. Um, this coat and shoes and her purse and the contents of her purse are on display. Uh, behind the case is a large photo that I just shared with you. It's on the wall, so you can really get a sense of um, the time and place. Um, some of the smaller artifacts on display there that you can see are, uh, there's a bracelet that has the 10 commandments on it, uh, a charm bracelet, and then a, a small necklace um, the little blue object is one of those um, rain covers for your hair. Um, and then there's a very small little child's Bible and then her purse and then a broken pencil. Um, the next case we wanna talk about is, is uh, focusing on the KKK in Texas. As Sarah described, um, of course, first of all, they were the perpetrators of that bombing. Um, and they were reacting against the civil rights movement and escalating their intimidation and violence. Um, the reason they attacked the 16th Avenue Baptist Church was because the 16th Avenue Baptist Church was a place where civil rights activists gathered to um, mobilize. Um, that morning, there were children gathering for a choir performance and it was Sunday morning and people were getting ready for church. But that church was part of a network of churches really coalescing to bring support to the African-American community and mobilize for the civil rights movement. And so it was targeted. People's homes were targeted and bombing, intimidation, attacks, physical, verbal, and, and murder were commonplace forms of abuse and intimidation and terror that were enacted by the KKK in the 1960s in reaction to the civil rights movement. But this was not new. Um, the KKK in Dallas in the 1920s was alive and well and using the same tactics. Um, I was astonished to learn through the donation of really our first human rights collection that the Dallas KKK was used as a prime example of the way a, the, a KKK um, unit should be. They were politically active. They recruited 
a, a huge number of recruits very quickly. They were um, pro prodigious authors. They produced lots of pamphlets and magazines and distributed them widely. And what you see on display is some remarkable artifacts showing the activities of the KKK here in Dallas in the 1920s. The large photograph in the back, uh, let me show you this, um, is from 1923 and it's from Klan Day at the State Fair. To give you an idea, at one of these of Klan Days at the State Fair, there were 150,000 people in attendance. To compare that, to the population of Dallas, Texas in 1920 was 210,000. So imagine the intimidation and, and of course this would have drawn people from outside of Dallas, but I'm trying to paint a picture of how many people were coming to this and how many people were really attaching themselves to this movement and how intimidating and terrifying it must've been. During the same time period, the early 20s, there were rampant attacks, physical attacks, lynchings in Dallas. Um, it did eventually become somewhat of a uh, PR issue. The Dallas Morning News in particular was publishing articles that were getting picked up by national and international press saying, you know, this is an embarrassment. We, this is not, representing Dallas in the appropriate way. Um, however, a senator was elected representing the KKK party in 1924. Um, they submitted someone who ran for governor who got a great deal of votes. Eventually it went, it receded somewhat. There was internal infighting in the KKK political um, hierarchy and there was dissension in the ranks and it, it receded somewhat, but again, it came back with a vengeance in, in the 1960s to combat the civil rights movement. Let me check my time just one second. Okay, the artifacts on display here, there's a program to the far, my far left from the state fair. Um, so there was Klan Day at the fair. You, you could come to the state fair, you could become initiated and get your membership card. That's this small artifact right here. There was a great deal of pomp and circumstance. The ladies auxiliary could meet. The large panoramic photo here is of the Bugle Corps. So there was entertainment available. Um, this literature here, this was all published by um, uh, Mr. Evans, who went on to be uh, high, high in the hierarchy of the plan. And part of the reason he was so well regarded is because he was a um, eager publisher of anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, and of course, racially hate-filled publications like the ones you see here. So that he was, the, the Dallas Klan made a mark, if you will, by publishing and distributing basically hate speech. Here's a close up of that Clan Day at the Fair. Just to point out, um, it was sponsored. Uh, and one of our one of our docents said, Oh, this is sad because I love my Coca-Cola. Um, but it was sponsored by Coke um, and by some other companies. And significantly, and this is something, you know, I want to um, remind everyone that the the speakers, the the clan members themselves they were members of the police force, the mayor's office, lawyers, doctors, representing every rung of society. And they were perpetrating hate crimes regularly and they were not being prosecuted. They were in the DA's office for goodness sake. Here's some close-ups of some of those publications. Here's a close up of a membership card. And just, just as a highlight, this collection came to us through a donor named Sid Miller, who had worked in a, in a division with the FBI, um, trying to deescalate hate groups in Dallas, and then was with SMU as a professor and actually um, received this from someone who had been in the KKK who had recanted his membership. And so he gave this collection to this professor who then donated it to the museum. 
and we were so honored to receive it. Finally, just uh, one of these, uh, the final case of artifacts I want to highlight before we take a few questions. And if you have questions, feel free to type them in the Q and A's, um, and we will answer them. Uh, just a few artifacts focusing on segregation. Uh, we have some, like Sarah mentioned, water fountain, and then this center sign is on loan from us from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. It's from a doctor's waiting room. And, and then another segregated sign over here. These posters in the rear are on loan from us from the University of North Texas, and they are from CORE. Like Sarah was mentioning, the um, coordinating committee, they, these are protest posters. So just reminding that the Freedom Riders were protesting the segregation that had been struck down by the Supreme Court and trying to bring attention to it and move the needle. Okay, that's the presentation I have for you. And I think we can take some questions. Uh, okay. So uh, Felicia, can you unshare your screen? There you go. Did that work? <laughs> Okay. That's good enough. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so uh, we, we have actually some excellent questions that have come through. Um, two people wanted to know when uh, Jim Crow begins, and it begins roughly around 1877, right about the time that uh, that Reconstruction fails. Um, there's a question from Lauren Fulton, which is an excellent question. I, I'm going to actually read it out loud. It's really a first rate question. Um, uh, Lauren asks, uh, she says, there are many present day instances of corporations weighing in on social movements in attempts to appeal to more progressive audiences. Did Greyhound or Trailways have any official stances on the Freedom Riders movement or larger civil rights movement? Did they sanction the use of their property for these journeys? Additionally, for the many buses that were vandalized and or destroyed, was there any corporate response to the damage done to their property, financial repercussions, et cetera? So Lauren, a couple of things. First of all, neither Felicia nor I are American historians, so I, I can't give you the definitive answer. What I can tell you is uh, that I cannot find anything about either Greyhound or Trailways at the time having any kind of a stance one way or the other, I've looked. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not out there, but it's not readily accessible. That's the first thing. The second thing is, did they sanction the use of their property for these journeys? People were buying tickets legally and taking journeys. So there wasn't anything that, that uh, Trailways or Greyhound could do on that level to stop people from buying tickets and, and, and journeying. And remember that people were starting in DC where this was perfectly normal to ride Greyhound and trail, Trailways buses as blacks and as whites and not necessarily to sit in a segregated fashion. It's as they get into the deep South that these problems begin to occur. I also can't answer whether there were any kind of court cases attempting to recoup the losses that they suffered. Um, I don't know who would have been sued because the losses to the buses, and there's only two that I'm aware of that were, that were pretty much totaled, um, were led by local clan members who were acting in a thuggish way. And I don't know, short of class action suits, which I don't think existed at the time, I don't know how you would go after them and recoup. But what I would like to do is suggest to anybody who would like more information on the Freedom Riders to um, uh, get a book called Freedom Riders. Uh, it comes in an abridged version. Uh, and it comes in a full, uh, uh, very large version. It was written by an academic named Raymond Arsenault. And I will type that in the chat because he wrote the definitive history of this period and specifically of, of this. So, so hopefully that will, that will be able to answer uh, some of these questions better than I can. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now, okay? Felicia, would you like to? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either. I wonder if Greyhound has a corporate archivist. I can, I can dig around and see if I can find that out, but that might take more 
time than we have just right now. Not um, now, but it's probably not a bad idea for us yeah. to do because um, we have the exhibit for several several um, right. uh, more months. Um, okay, let's see what other questions we have. And I did put it, the name of it in the chat, so everybody should have that now. Um, Lauren Ray asks, do you have any info on the bus drivers or bus companies' reactions? Did they refuse to drive, protect the riders, abandon the buses? In fact, there were bus drivers who uh, refused when the buses, some of these buses got to Birmingham or into Mississippi, refused to take the buses any further and just walked, walked off the buses. Um, that was part of what was going on over the course of that summer. And again, if you want the names of the riders, um, ages of the riders, professions of the riders, because there's ultimately more than 400 riders. All of that is available in Arsenault's un unabridged uh, volume, which is available in a lot of libraries and is definitely available on Amazon as well. Um, we also have yeah. on YouTube our, um, our presentation with one of the Freedom Riders from a couple of weeks ago, which is available on our Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum YouTube page, which is worth looking up if you didn't catch it. It was really a wonderful presentation. She, Betty Daniels, do I have that right? Betty Roseman okay. Daniels, yes, you do. Okay, okay. Um, and we have a question about our, our biggest takeaway from the exhibit. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab mm -hmm. at that. Um, I think for me, I actually was speaking with our assistant archivist today because I had this little tailspin because I found in an article um, a description of a, a, a summer in 1923 when 68 people were beaten um, in the Trinity River area of Dallas and no one was prosecuted and you know this miscarriage of justice and one of the individuals was a Jewish shopkeeper but most of the individuals who were attacked and beaten and, and in fact several of them were um, lynched were black um, and then in that same article there was mentions of a name that was very familiar to me which means to me usually they're in the archive somewhere and so I was talking to our assistant archivist and it turns out that that guy Evans had authored several of those pamphlets we shared today and she helped me figure it out but when I was talking to her I, I was struck and it and I guess this was my takeaway just at the depth or the the fact that the four young ladies who were murdered in that bombing contributed more in their short life and had more going for them. They, they were active in their community and they were positive forces. Mm -hmm. And just the fear that those KKK fellows had and to motivate so much hatred towards them, it, it boggles my mind still. And as a Holocaust museum, we see the bizarre effect of hatred motivating anti-Semitism. It doesn't make sense to the logical mind that's not overrun by crazy hatred. It doesn't make sense and it shouldn't make sense. But to see that just racial motivated hatred towards innocence, you know, it just, and that and it, that fear that would motivate them to just spend their energy, effort, everything they had to act out of hate. And so that that kind of, that's what I, my takeaway, I guess. Uh, there's another question here, and I, this will be our last question, but I actually wanted to answer it because it's an excellent question. And this is from Dale Long, uh, who will be talking uh, uh, in a, reference to this exhibit uh, in April at the museum. Um, and Mr. Long was actually in Birmingham as a, as a child at the 16th Street Baptist Church, I believe, when the day of the bombing. So uh, what Mr. Long says is, I am amazed how Dr. King used the media to illustrate the events in Birmingham circa 1960. In the absence of digital technology, how did the photographers distribute their images so quickly? I remember seeing these images on the five o'clock national news. Well, believe it or not, from the early, uh, from the fairly early 20th century onward, photos were distributed over wire services. Um, you would have a wire sending machine on one end for photos, and you would have a duplicate wire receiving machine on the other end, and it could be transmitted very, very quickly. Film was more difficult, but photo, photo, film meaning moving, moving images, but 
photos could be done. Um, the quickest or easiest illustration I can give of this, and again, I'm showing my age, are the original telefax machines, as they were called, where you would put something in a telefax machine on one end, like in your congressman's office, and it would whir like crazy, and it would then show up on the other end in a receiving machine in Washington, DC. And, and the, these are a variation of those machines. But so the stuff was transmitted very, very quickly. Now, because they were being printed in grainy, um, in grainy newspapers, or because they were being shown on televisions that were not in high definition, they didn't have to be the digital quality that we have come to expect um, and uh, have all been spoiled by, I think. So, uh, Annie, would you take us out? Yes, I will. My video's taking a moment to show up. There we are, there I am. Uh, thank you both, uh, Felicia and Sarah, as always, for being with us tonight and sharing this important history. Again, we hope if you haven't had a chance to come see the exhibit at the museum, uh, you do so. We do have a virtual experience online, but it doesn't include some of these new artifacts that uh, Felicia shared with you. That exhibit runs through May 31st. I will give one more plug for our program coming up on April 15th with Dale Long. Uh, good to see you here, Dale. Dale is actually a survivor of that 16th Street church bombing, and we'll be talking about his experiences and how he's really dedicated his life uh, kind of in honor and in memory of the friends that he lost uh, on that day. So we hope you'll join us April 15th. If you go to our website, dhhrm.org, you can see that and all of our upcoming programs and get yourself registered. Uh, so as always, we hope you have a great night, stay well, stay safe, and we will see everyone next time. Thank you so much.